and a program today which will be very dear to anyone with a passing interest in the activity commonly known as twitching. You might have heard a news story this week about concerns over the growing numbers of that great Australian larrikin bird, the magpie, in our cities, as apparently their aggressive behaviour pushes out other local species. The Maggie, of course, is a very easy bird to identify, but Australia was once home to some of the most diverse and unusual bird species in the world. And we know this thanks to the efforts of those scientifically curious folk who very early on in the European settlement of this continent began to observe and name these little nuggets of nature all around Australia. And sometimes, as you'll hear in today's program, they pursued their passion at great peril. From the mysterious night parrot to the spangled drongo, let's join producer Martin Hewitson for the story of bird fancying in Australia. On one of the later voyages, the last of the great French expeditions run by Jules de Montduville, he was given a black cockatoo and they reported that this poor bird, they didn't know how to care for it and it died on the voyage home in great agony, emitting huge tearing shrieks and wails and dreadful noises, which was very sad that the bird died, but I, I always think that's an interesting observation, that they clearly didn't have much experience of cockatoos in the wild, or they would have realised that that wasn't really indicative of agony, it was just the natural call of the black cockatoo. They're just these little nuggets of nature that remind us of what an incredibly complex and wonderful ecosystem that we live in. The story of the study of birds in Australia is a fascinating one, full of amazing discoveries and lost opportunities. There's death by misadventure, murder, and even a bird of which so little is known, it's considered to be the holy grail among serious ornithologists. But the story doesn't start at the bustling port at Circular Quay, or in the Australian outback, but in Europe. Dr Daniel Claude works at the Department of Zoology at the University of Melbourne, and she takes us back to the late 18th century. This is a period where natural history is just emerging from an occupation of um, enthusiastic amateurs, if you like. And in France, because of the French Revolution, you've got the emergence of a new, almost professional class of biologists, which happens much earlier in France than it did, say, in Britain. And because the social upheaval at the time was seeking to take away um, the rights and privileges of the aristocracy they removed science as an activity from the aristocrats and gave it to everybody to have an opportunity so you had these people who were really seeking to move up through the social hierarchy through their intellectual and scientific achievements and that's what made this activity of going out and collecting whether it be botany or um, zoology such a desirable activity for them and they really specialised quite early they might have started out with medical backgrounds it was very common for them to do medical degrees but then they would move on and specialise and they specialised very precisely into things like botany which is an older um, discipline if you like or into the newer disciplines of zoology and even anthropology which many of these French scientists were founders of and their contacts with Australian Aboriginals were some of the earliest anthropological works but this wasn't a job for the faint-hearted, and the risks were immense. It was really common for many of the people not to come back. That's part of the success of voyages is dependent upon the survival of the people who went. And one of the reasons Cook was such a successful sailor was because he actually managed to keep most of his crew alive. As for collectors and scientists dying, it was so common that a great many people suggested that there should be a martyrology because it was such a risky occupation to go out. But, you know, they were young men, um, they were engaged in activities they often went ashore and got lost, they fell down mountains, but really the highest risk was disease and scurvy, of course, and dysentery in Southeast Asia. Those sorts of things were the primary causes of death, I suppose. During the late 1700s, the European naval powers were filling in all the blanks on the globe. But whereas the British were concerned with increasing the size of the empire, the French were more focused on gaining knowledge. Their ships all had a collector of some sort on board, 
and all the ship's crew are fascinated by Australia's birds and animals. Dr Penny Olson is a visiting fellow at the Australian National University and is editor of the Birds Australia magazine, Wingspan. Australian ornithology has gone through a few phases. Uh, in England, for example, Australian birds were the all the rage in the late 1700s, early 1800s. They couldn't get enough information about our odd critters here, not only the birds. Um, so I think that's sort to me the first golden age. One of the most important ornithologists who came on the French expeditions was René Lesson, who was actually the ship's pharmacist. So in this case, it really depended upon the individual interests and uh, specialisation of the men on board. And in this case, it was the pharmacist, uh, René Lesson, who, who was particularly interested. He was really responsible for all the zoological collections, but he's most well known as an ornithologist. Um, he did really important work on hummingbirds in the Americas. Um, he produced a large number of publications and monographs on birds. He was one of the earliest Europeans to collect um, birds of paradise from New Guinea. And naturally, Australia was a huge source of fascination for him with a, just the range of species and, and the diversity of species that he found in the Blue Mountains and elsewhere. And those collections um, were really important when they came back to France and they, they built upon a long tradition of, of collections in ornithology. Some of the most famous were um, the collections that came back from the Bodan expedition and the interesting thing about Bodan's expeditions is that he brought back live specimens specifically. That was his area of specialty. And he brought back black swans, which were then released in the gardens at Malmaison, which was the Empress Josephine's garden. Um, and they figure heavily in her design and inside the house there, the little motif of the swan, the black swan, was very symbolic for Josephine at the time as this sort of Antipodean black swan versus the white swan of Europe. So, so they were a really important feature in the artwork at the time. By the middle of the 19th century, Australia had become a thriving new country. Cities on the coast were growing rapidly, and more and more people were exploring and researching further and further inland. One of these was a British naturalist appointed to Her Majesty's ship, the Beagle. When Charles Darwin visited Australia in about 1835, he was following in that tradition of, of scientists travelling. Now, the interesting thing about reading Darwin's accounts is how broad his thought processes are. If you read his Journal of Researches, it's just fascinating to see he'll make an observation of... Um, an ant lion and he'll be drawing comparative parallels with species in the northern hemisphere and what they do and don't do. Like all naturalists at the time, Darwin was an avid collector of beetles, butterflies and birds, in fact of any creature or plant that was considered new to science. Australia too had a growing circle of the well-heeled and scientifically curious and there was a thriving industry around keeping these people supplied with new specimens to study and preserve. One of the best known of these collectors was William John Maclay, who lived in the then sparsely populated area of what is now Sydney's Elizabeth Bay. Ashley Hay is a journalist and writer. William John Maclay is one of those great figures in Australian scientific history who wasn't what we would think of as a professional scientist by today's sort of educational standards or anything else. But he was one of these men who had an amazing amount of money and an amazing passion for natural history. And he spent a great deal of his time and a great deal of his fortune amassing a collection of quite extraordinary specimens, not just from Australia, but from all around the world. Uh, he wanted to do this to expand a family collection that had already been um, underway, I guess, for almost a century by the time he came along and really turned his attention to it. And he wanted to do this partly to donate it to the University of Sydney. He had a very strong commitment to education and to enabling research, which is still a very attractive thing today. Um, and he was also a very generous person in terms of, I guess, what we would think of as philanthropy now. One of the things that he was particularly concerned with was enabling people to work at naming and classifying 
Australian species. Australia, of course, has this extraordinary repository of wildlife that just doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, there's still so much of it that we don't know about. But in the 1870s and the 1880s, when William John Maclay was doing most of his work, the amount that was available for you to, to study and to name and to classify and to kind of bring into the annals of natural science in that way was pretty overwhelming. All over the world, naturalists were collecting and cataloguing as many creatures and plants as possible, sending them to museums to be studied and named. In 1753, a Swedish doctor, Carl Linnaeus, had created a system of classification where everything the earth produced could be divided into animal, mineral and vegetable. As many birds had several regional names, even in the same country, a standard and agreed Latin name meant that naturalists wouldn't have to learn the many local versions. This also helped as information about a single species could be easily transferred across countries and between continents. What William John Maclay does that's important in terms of the development of science in Australia is that he takes the model of the Linnaean Society in London and he sets up similar societies in New South Wales. First of all, the Entomological Society, which comes into being in the 1860s and is mainly interested, of course, in insects, in butterflies and beetles and other sorts of bugs. And then in the 1870s, he sets up the Linnaean Society of New South Wales which is actually still a functioning scientific institution today. In terms of taxonomy, this not only provides interested workers with a forum where they can get together, where they can look at new species that they don't think they've seen before, where they can sort of unveil their classifications of things for each other and their names for things, but he also understands the importance of publishing these things and what he does that is a, a crucial point in terms of Australian development is that he sets up journals attached to both of these societies so that for the first time the names and the classification of Australian species can be published in Australia. The work doesn't have to be sent back to be published in London, to be published somewhere in Europe. But even with taxonomy, things aren't always as straightforward as they seem. Dr Leo Joseph is the director of the Australian Natural Wildlife Collection in the Division of Sustainable Ecosystems at the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation. The study of taxonomy and the uh, related areas of how things are related to each other is a big area. We can't communicate information about the biology of organisms without a name. Now, for the better known, more familiar things like birds, one tends not to think about the fact that we still have a lot of uncertainty about the names that need to be applied to uh, species. The grey fantail story is a good one because in 1974 when the first edition of Peter Slater's Field Guide to Australian Birds came out you had the grey fantail and it was just illustrated in the field guide with one picture, the grey fantail. Similarly in 1980 with the first edition of Graham Pizzi's Field Guide. Then um, a taxonomist looked at all the specimens of grey fantails in museums and reassessed the taxonomy of the bird and out of that work grew an understanding that the populations of these birds that live in the mangroves of northwestern Australia are a completely different thing called the mangrove fantail. Uh, populations up on the in the wet tropics of uh, Queensland around the Atherton Tableland area, that sort of region, are very different. They're very dark birds and they needed a new name. The populations in central Australia are different, have quite distinctive white on their tail and so on. And so now you go into a bookshop for your Christmas shopping and you buy the latest uh, edition of, of a field guide to Australian birds and you'll see a whole lot of different grey fantails illustrated and twitchers and bird watchers can now go out and look for all these different forms uh, and see them regardless in some ways of whether they're called species or not. Luckily, for future researchers, people who had the money and desire to collect did so with an incredible enthusiasm. 
William John Mackay was an extraordinarily passionate collector. He was the kind of man who, uh, you know, always tried to fit in a visit to the taxidermy shops that were operating around Sydney just to see what might have come in that he needed to buy. And he almost always found something that he needed to buy when he was in there, whether it was a box of several hundred bird skins. He bought an awful lot of bird skins, which had come in particularly from North America, or whether it was you know, one very rare specimen of something, um, a snake, um, some kind of preserved fish. He bought, he went in one day between some other appointments and came out with an entire skeleton of an Aboriginal female. So there was a, there was a, a very broad, uh, range of interests, shall we say, that he was, uh, he was looking for. He had an amazing network of, uh, contacts around Sydney. He was a, an important and influential man. He was a member of parliament. He was a successful squatter. And so he had a network of friends at, at that kind of echelon of society. And they would all bring him specimens as well. They would bring him shells. They would bring him lizards. Um, he would meet a friend for a drink in a very salubrious club in Sydney and they might pull a pickle jar out that had some live geckos in it that they thought he would be interested in. He was friends with a lot of doctors and they would, you know, extract all sorts of things from their patients and, and hand those over. But he was also very friendly with the people who worked around Sydney Harbour. His house, um, the family's house at Elizabeth Bay, the very famous Elizabeth Bay house, went right down to the water and he was intensely interested in what you could get out of the harbour and what other people could get out of the harbour and there are lovely stories about fishermen turning up on his doorstep one of them trying to sell some fish to Mrs Maclay for them to eat and the other one trying to sell something to Mr Maclay because it's a rare thing that he might not have seen before. Just before he died William John Maclay used his considerable influence and arranged to have his collection housed at Sydney University so it could be viewed and studied by future generations. While MacLeod used his wealth to collect birds, others were looking at birds as a way of actually making money, including one man who's known as the father of Australian ornithology. John Gould played a very important role in the history of Australian ornithology. He, uh, he named and illustrated many of Australia's birds for the first time. He, um, his story is quite an interesting one. He started out working as a taxidermist for the Zoological Society in London and made a name for himself preparing a mounted specimen of a giraffe for the, uh, for the monarchy. However, he, uh, he was, he's quite a talented ornithologist, but he was also a, a budding entrepreneur and book publisher and he saw an opportunity to publish a big lavish folio style book on the birds of the Himalayas and he uh, in this book illustrated and described a hundred species of birds from the Himalayas and it was illustrated by his long-suffering wife Elizabeth. There was a very good response to that and he realized he was onto something big so he set his sights on becoming a publisher and and putting his ornithological interests into book publishing. So he realised that the Australian continent was a bit of an ornithological blank and at that time in the early 19th century uh, specimens of natural history items, birds, mammals and whatnot, were pouring into England and Europe. And Gould by the 1830s had named 20 odd species of Australian birds. Lyrebird. Funereal cockatoo, friar bird, warbling grass parakeet, Australian bellbird. Gould and his wife visited Australia in 1838, and Gould's appetite for collecting birds, both new and old, was insatiable. 20th December 1838, Research Bay. Tasmania. We intend shifting our locality tomorrow morning. We're going into Southport, 15 miles distance from this, near a home. This move is principally on my account for the purpose of affording me a new locality for my rambles. I have this day killed rather an extraordinary bird, 
and one that you'll recollect, at least there's every probability of it being the same, you will remember the large snow-white petrel, a variety of the black species, which followed us nearly all the way from the Cape to Tasman's Head, and which I was so desirous of procuring without affecting my purpose. I have also killed some beautiful albatrosses, petrels, ducks, etc., and four nests with full complement of eggs of the black oyster catcher, small and large gulls, a teal, etc., besides a nest with young of the emu wren and other minor things. There's a lovely story from the Elizabeth Bay Garden uh, that predates William John Maclay's residency. It's when his cousin, William Sharp Maclay, who was also very involved in, uh, in the amassing of the family collection, um, when William Sharp Maclay was in residence at Elizabeth Bay House and John Gould, the you know, soon to be very famous naturalist, visited him, they spend an afternoon... I imagine sort of wandering around looking at, at what they can find in these beautiful grounds at Elizabeth Bay. And one of the animals that they come across is a brush turkey and they watch this bird's, you know, behaviour and they watch its, uh, its sort of antics for quite a while. And at some point the bird catches sight of its own reflection in a pail of water and I think we've all seen birds doing this if they see themselves in a mirror and they're not really sure what they're looking at and how they should react. Well, this poor brush turkey thought that its reflection in the water was a rival and it ended up actually drowning itself in the water trying to attack and see off this rival, presumably while William Sharp Maclay and John Gould looked on and <laughs> didn't interfere, which I can only assume is sort of their version of the in the name of science defence. During his 18 months in Australia... There were no lengths that Gould wouldn't go to to get the birds he wanted. Here, he describes the difficulty in getting close to a lyrebird. Independently of climbing over rocks and fallen stumps of trees, the sportsman has to creep and crawl beneath and among the branches with the utmost caution, taking care only to advance when the bird's attention is occupied in singing or in scratching up the leaves in search of food. To watch its actions, it's necessary to remain perfectly motionless, not venturing to move even in the slightest degree, or it vanishes from sight as if by magic. None are so efficient in obtaining specimens as the naked black, whose noiseless and gliding steps enable him to steal upon it unheard and unperceived, and with a gun in his hand, he rarely allows it to escape and in many instances, he will even kill it with his own weapons. Gould's name is still well known in Australia, at least to anyone with an interest in birds. But Gould himself wasn't in this country for very long, and he relied upon others to risk life and limb to collect the birds that he needed for his drawings. Dr Clemency Fisher is a curator of vertebrate zoology at the National Museum in Liverpool, England. She has spent over three decades piecing together the story and locating the specimen birds of Gould's principal collector, John Gilbert. It was John Gilbert who went to Western Australia when it was really a very young colony. The British colony had only been there a few years, so it was just an undiscovered mine of beautiful natural objects everywhere. So... Gilbert collected there on two separate periods, actually, over the years between 1838 and about 1844. Linnaeus had long ago created a method where all birds would have the same scientific Latin name. These names were given by the person who classified the bird as being something new, and when it came to Gilbert's discoveries, it was John Gould. Gould very occasionally named species for family and friends including the Gouldian finch, that he named in the memory of his wife, who died shortly after childbirth in 1840. In late 1844, he received a letter from Gilbert. Almost the first bird shot is a totally new parrot. Without exception, the most beautiful of the whole tribe I have ever seen in Australia. The mingling of the beautiful shades of green is its most conspicuous and beautiful character. If you've not already honoured my poor name in your works, I know of no species that would delight me more to see Gilbertia attached to than this beautiful bird. 
John Gould did name the Gilbert's Whistler after John Gilbert. The scientific name doesn't reflect Gilbert, but it's still called Gilbert's Whistler, which I think is rather nice. But the one bird that Gilbert wanted um, to be called after him was actually this beautiful green parrot he discovered on the Darling Downs, um, which, of course, is now called the Paradise Parrot and, sadly, is now extinct. It's um, really been looked for um, very intensely over the last few years and is, is obviously gone. But I think it's quite sad that... I don't think it's sad that it's called the Paradise Parrot because I think that's a lovely name, but I think it's sad that of all... Gilbert's species that he discovered, the one he really wanted to be called after him was this lovely parrot. And Gould said rather off-handedly that he already had Gilbert's Whistler called after him and the Gilbert's Pottery, and that was enough. So he called it the Paradise Parrot, Cephotus Pulcherimus. And Gilbert really did a very, very good job in logging that species around the Darling Downs before it disappeared. Regardless of what his boss did back in England, Gilbert still had a job to do and he was always looking for ways to explore areas of Australia unknown to Europeans. John Gilbert was on the Darling Downs for quite a while between, I suppose, about July and September 1844. And we think he must have been at Cecil Down Station when he met the German explorer Ludwig Leichhardt. Gil must have heard tales about him because Leichhardt had been in the area before collecting. He was more of a geologist than anything at that time, he was collecting geological specimens, some botany. So Leichhardt was quite well known to the station owners, at least by repute. And we think it's at Cecil Downs that Gilbert and Leichhardt were introduced. And Leichhardt would have told Gilbert about his purported expedition north to Port Essington, along the coast of Queensland and through completely uncharted territory, up the coast along Cape York, which really wasn't known except from the coast, and then across what is now Northern Territory to the tiny colony of Port Essington. When you think about it, to actually try to cross Australia, which was unknown at the time, to this tiny colony perched right at the top of Australia it was completely mad, really. Leichhardt had tried to get his expedition declared an official government expedition, but Sir Thomas Mitchell didn't like that idea at all. He wanted to do his own expedition. So Leichhardt had to make it a private expedition and really take just whoever was prepared to drop everything and go. And Gilbert, being there with all his collecting equipment, was one of those. They set forth on the 1st of September 1844 along from the Darling Downs from Jimbore House, which of course is a beautiful house that's still there, now National Trust House open to the public, and really from then onwards north was completely uncharted territory. <laughs> so the Leichhardt expedition moved forward from Jimball House through regions that just had never been looked at or discovered or explored by European people before. They named so many features along there that people just now don't realise were called by members of the expedition. The Dawson River they named, Charlie's Creek was named after one of the Aboriginals who was with the party. The Peak Range was named by like art as he saw it, the peaks floating on the plain, as he said. And all the way along, Gilbert was writing madly in his diary all the features they'd seen and all the nature, the natural objects that he found along the way. For several months, the journey went well. Gilbert, who was a working member of the party, didn't collect as many species as he'd have liked, yet he was still finding new and exciting birds and animals. Gilbert did collect some very interesting new forms on the expedition. One of them is actually a thing that's now called Leichhardt's rat kangaroo, which is attributed to Leichhardt, but it was actually collected by Gilbert, and the types of that are actually in the Australian Museum. And he collected the new species, which was later called the white-browed robin, 
by John Gould. That's Hoysalodryas superciliosis. He collected that a bit further north on the Sutter River. They worked their way north, um, not really realising that instead of crossing towards Port Sessington, they were actually just going up into Cape York Peninsula. It wasn't well known Cape York. The coast was known quite well, but inland wasn't well known. So they didn't realise they were going too far up that and would later have to come all the way down again. Leichhardt named the Lynn River, in which they went up, and then the Mitchell River. And they realised that they were being shadowed by Aboriginals at, at that time. And they were quite aggressive. And the theory is that the two Aboriginals that were with the expedition, who were called Charlie and Brown, Charlie Fisher and Harry Brown, were actually going to see the Aboriginals at night and causing fights and that sort of thing. And that's possibly why on the 28th of June, 1845, the expedition was attacked at the top of the Mitchell River. And very sadly, Gilbert was killed by a spear which hit him in the neck as he was trying to get out of his tent. And it must have pierced the carotid artery because he died almost instantly. Leichhardt said that he'd actually said, here, Charlie, have my gun, I'm dying. But whether he just made that up or not, as a, as a kind of elegy to Gilbert, we don't know. But he died very, very quickly. After quickly burying Gilbert, Leichhardt's party began the long, slow journey to Port Essington and on Christmas, 1845, stumbled out of the jungle, having either eaten or ditched most of the animals and birds they'd collected. Hello, you're listening to Hindsight, and today, the history of Australian ornithology. As Australia's population grew, and the blanks in the map were filled in, there were fewer and fewer new birds to be found. However, this didn't stop people from wanting to see and hear birds, or from collecting their nests and eggs. It was around this time, at the end of the 19th century, that many ornithologists believed it was necessary for Australia to have a recognisable ornithological organisation. Dr Libby Robin is an environmental historian who works at the Australian National University. I think the idea of an ornithological society for all of Australia came around about the same time as uh, we were thinking about the politics of all of Australia, Federation, 1901. And the group that met in 1896 and were considering a national ornithological union were also the sorts of people who were very concerned about the Federation of the Australian States. They did meet in Melbourne originally, but there were also very strong ornithological groups in South Australia. And in fact, the South Australian Ornithological Association began in 1899, before the national one, the Royal Australasian Ornithologists' Union. It wasn't royal until 1910, but it was RAOU for most of the 20th century. It's now called Birds Australia. When the 17 naturalists first met in 1896 in South Yarra, I guess they were wanting to have an occasion to talk with each other about their big finds. A lot of them were egg collectors or oologists as they like to call themselves and they wanted to find out where the good eggs were and compare clutches and a lot of the early uh, ornithological studies in Australia were actually studies of the seasonal breeding of birds and particularly weird clutches so clutches with seven eggs or clutches with a funny colour or clutches from unlikely places were all sort of subjects for discussion. There were two big groups of egg collectors. One was uh, centred in Melbourne and one was centred in Sydney. The Sydney egg collecting was mostly done by Alfred North at the Australian Museum and he had nothing to do with the first Australasian Ornithologists' Union. He was quite separate and I think partly because there was a bit of a competition about egg collecting that he kept his work separate from the, the union. But down in Melbourne... There were a range of amateurs who wanted to share knowledge about egg collecting together. So they'd, they'd meet for a meeting and talk about where they found a weird clutch or where they found nesting at an unusual time of the year or something like that. 
there was a sort of social egg collecting that was quite prominent in the union and there was a sort of scientific egg collecting that was much more prominent in the museums, certainly the Australian Museum in particular. So what's the purpose of a national union? Why would you get together and have a union of people all over Australia at a time when it's actually quite a long way to get from Melbourne to Adelaide, let alone from uh, Melbourne to, say, the Kimberley or the Gulf of Carpentaria? And the answer is to publish a journal. Uh, like the British Ornithologists' Union and the American Ornithologists' Union, the Australasian Ornithologists' Union wanted its own journal and followed the same pattern as the others of naming it after a, a big bird in its area. So the American Ornithologists' Union is, uh, journal is called the Orc, the British Ornithologists' Union is called the Ibis, and the Australian, or the Australasian as it was then, is called the Emu. And so the Emu is a journal now that's been running for over a hundred years. It's since in the 21st century it's acquired a subtitle called Austral Ornithology, the Ornithology of the South, if you like, and that's now published by CSIRO Publishing and is really quite a, a mainstream scientific journal. From its inception in 1901 to the latest issue that came out just the other day, one can see the history of much of ornithology in the 20th century, how approaches have changed and how interests have changed. It's, uh, I wouldn't underestimate the importance of a journal like the EMU. While John Gould died 20 years before the RAOU was formed, he still continued to influence the field of Australian ornithology. One of the legacies of John Gould was the league that was named in his honour, the Gould League, which I think many Australians will have been a member of as children. It started in 1909 and varied in different states as to how important it was, but it, you always had to promise not to steal birds' eggs and you had to promise to look after nature in general later on. Uh, if, you, if you do have a certificate at home, you should read the words carefully on your certificate because often it, it, they have different words in different eras. But first of all, it was you're not allowed to use a slingshot and you're not allowed to steal birds' eggs, but later it became much more, I'll, I'll have concern for the environment and, and look after all creatures, not just birds. I think there was a division within the union at this period because, in fact, egg collecting went on as a serious pursuit by gentlemen well into the 1920s and 30s. And as well as that, we were having in the same pages of the same journal reported that we were doing this and that for the Gould League. So I think that there were actually two streams of thought within the union about whether it was good to collect eggs or it was bad to collect eggs. But by the 1930s, this was something that became quite a tense thing at campouts, which was the main activity of the union once a year was to have a campout in a different part of Australia each year. And one of the campouts was held at Marlow in eastern Victoria. And there, one of the people present as a member of the union went out and shot one of the birds in front of everybody there. They'd been watching this bird all week and he went out and shot it. Now he was working at the museum in Victoria and he was collecting the bird for the museum's collection. So there was a really good scientific reason to take the bird. But there was this huge wave of sentiment against him for shooting the bird that they had been watching. People felt affection towards this particular bird and it was a, a dreadful thing to shoot it in front of everyone and George Mack the collector was I think one of those people who wasn't very good with people and didn't realize what an impact that would have but it very nearly tore the union apart and people were very unhappy and some of them refused to go on campouts with the RAOU for years after that so I think that there were always uh, some people who felt that collecting birds or collecting eggs were important for science and some people who felt that one should never do that. Sean Dooley is an author and avid bird watcher and holds Australia's unofficial record for having seen the most number of birds in a single year at 703. 
I first joined the Gould League when I was about eight, and I was into much more of a general nature. I just liked anything. I liked their posters and their stickers and things like that. And then I joined again a couple of years later when I was 11, and I was already into bird watching, and that was fantastic for me because it gave me a lot of information. In fact, the first bird books that I had were given to me by an, an old auntie, and they were the Gould League Book of Urban Birds, and uh, it was just fantastic to have though not a definitive guide it, it had a lot of the birds that i was seeing in my suburban backyard and being able to put a name to those things really kicked along my interest in birds it was one thing to appreciate them out in the backyard and think they were pretty but it was something else again to actually be able to kind of discursively conquer that bird by giving it a name and knowing what it was Over the course of the 20th century, our interest in birds would change, and by the middle of it, would have shifted away from shooting and collecting to watching and protecting. The very first people who met in the Union were very interested in their egg collections. They all had beautiful egg collections in boxes and compared them with each other. And some of them also collected birds themselves, so that they would have stuffed birds or uh, a few birds sitting on nests, perhaps, as table decorations. Then, in the next era, I guess we moved to collecting photographs, and some of the photographs became really very beautiful and quite complicated, so there was a bit of a competition about how difficult it was to get the photo, and there were competitions where there were prizes, financial prizes, honour, glory, whatever, for getting a beautiful photograph of a bird in an unusual place. And then we started to get sound and movement. And so you start getting films about birds and audio about birds. The very first audio tracks of birds were often of lyrebirds because lyrebirds imitate other birds. So they're quite, quite noisy and they make a, a lot of, they make good radio. The ABC recorded lyrebirds both in Melbourne and Sydney uh, as early as the 1930s and broadcast them on radio. People in both cities and also in Brisbane had lyrebirds in the hinterland and were quite fond of lyrebirds. They were a special local bird for the big cities. There were also lyrebirds introduced into Tasmania, I think probably because of their popularity in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. So that most of the big cities not Adelaide or Perth, but most of the big cities knew about lyrebirds and they knew that they could imitate other birds and indeed in Gippsland there were, there were lyrebirds that could imitate chainsaws and all sorts of things. They pick up the sounds that are in the, the landscape and they could repeat them perfectly. We always think of parrots as great imitators, but, but lyrebirds are really, really clever because they can persuade other birds that they are that bird and you get them calling to a golden whistler or to another bird and replying, which is really remarkable. So ornithology has gone through several eras since Europeans first arrived here over 200 years ago. But we still haven't answered the question about why people are so fascinated with birds. I think with birds that, you know, you can go into all sorts of reasons why they matter. They're esoteric reasons because they're so beautiful and they come in such a ar vast array of colours and sizes and beak shapes and, and they sing in a multitude of voices and, and they fly whereas we're kind of earthbound and, and they, they represent freedom and, and beauty. And, but I think even more important than that is birds really matter because they're a, a, pretty much everywhere. You get them from Antarctica to the tops of the Himalayas and uh, and they're the only often palpable sign of nature around us. And it's about the only one we actually take any notice of. And I think when it comes down to it, that's why birds matter. They're constant connections and reminders that we are part of the natural world. <laughs>
The great thing about taxonomy, as I see it from a, a sort of storyteller's point of view, is that it is the work of looking at something and naming it and classifying it when it has never been looked at before. If someone had told me when I was doing high school science that, that it was possible to have this profession where you could look at things that no one had studied before and you could work out what it was that made them similar to other things and different to other things and you could come up with a name for them, I would have just thought that was the most fascinating profession you could undertake. Watching birds and seeing birds and looking for birds, even if I don't see them, just being out in the field, out in nature and just chasing after the birds. I've never found anything in my life that just brings me pure, unadulterated joy like that does. They're just incredible creatures with really interesting habits and distributions. And, and I just find being out in the countryside uh, doesn't even have to be remote countryside, just being anywhere and, and finding birds, it's just a pure joy. Australia itself is still in many ways what Australia was when Joseph Banks first came here with Captain Cook in 1770 and started to collect these amazing natural history specimens that no one had seen before. There is still so much here that we don't know about. There are, there are still so many species that haven't been studied, that haven't been looked at. One of these species is the incredibly enigmatic night parrot. Named by John Gould in 1854, there are only 25 specimens of the bird in museums around the world, and 16 of these were collected by one person in South Australia between the 1870s and 80s. Between 1912, when one was shot, to the present day, there's been an endless search to get a clear sighting of the bird. Well, the night parrot really is the holy grail of Australian birds, and I must admit I've um, become one of those seekers of, of that holy grail, and I've looked for night parrots out in the middle of the Spinifex Plains in South Australia and Western Queensland. Clearly, I haven't seen it because I don't know of any reputable sighting of, one, of a live bird. I know a lot of people have claimed to see them, and I'd suspect that it's a bit like that, you know, Loch Ness Monster or Tasmanian Tiger. Once somebody knows something's out there, they kind of can string something together. A, a half-seen thing can become a definite sighting. But I think people do see night parrots, and I'd say, you know, even if it's only 10% of claims, I, I reckon would be genuine. So they're certainly out there, but they're just so incredibly cryptic, and we don't know anything about them really. We call them the night parrot because they've been seen drinking at night in the 19th century and calling and moving about but you know we just don't know anything about them so that's what makes them even more intriguing and I know there are there are bird watchers who are kind of dedicating their lives to trying to be the one to discover the night, rediscover the night parrot in its live state. And as far as we know, bird fancier Sean Dooley is still searching for his elusive winged holy grail. Today's program, Night Parrots and Spangled Drongos, The History of Australian Ornithology, was produced by Martin Hewitson, and the sound engineer was that old magpie, Philip Ullman. And if you'd like more information about this history, Birds Australia, or references to books mentioned in today's program, then just go to our website, that's abc.net.au slash rn, and follow the prompts to hindsight.